What do the talking heads think about the University of Tennessee heading into the 2023 season? No Hendon Hooker, no Cedric Tillman, no Jalen Hyatt, no Darnell Wright on the offensive line, Byron Young, yada yada. But year three with Josh Heupel, what can the Vols do? Jesse Simonson of On3 joins us here on today's Locked On Vols. You are Locked On Vols, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Friday, everybody, and welcome to Locked On Balls. It is your team every single day. Thanks so much for making it your first listen. We're a part of Locked On Podcast Network. That is your team every single day. And of course, shout out to the everydayers. Couldn't do this show without you. It's been a fun week. We've had a whole lot of guests onto the show, and we're kind of looking ahead to uh, 2023 Tennessee, of course, and what that might look like and the gap in the SEC East and with Georgia and, of course, Alabama on the other side and uh, some of those other SEC powers. So had a good time this week, and we're going to continue to uh, keep this ball rolling and we bring on uh, a, a good good guy from On3, Jesse Simonson, formerly of VolQuest, but uh, now over at On3. Jesse, what's up, man? How's it doing, Canner? It's doing well, man, doing well. Um, you've been hard at work uh, going, the, going through all that offseason content with – you know, head coaching rankings and position group rankings and, and all that good stuff. Um, overall, from what you saw, uh, a little bit of Tennessee from the spring, kind of what do you like about this team? I mean, Tennessee's going to score points. I think we know that this offense, really regardless of who the trigger man is, whether it's Joe Milton uh, or, or now, obviously, it's going to be um, – well, whether it's Hennon Hooker, excuse me, now it's going to be Joe Milton. If Nico gets his opportunity, I think all – quarterbacks just garner success in Josh Heupel's system because he is so good at drawing up these layups. And so uh, while it may not, you know, basically turn into the greatest NFL draft results, I know some Tennessee fans, you know, maybe may a little frustrated at where wideouts like Jalen Hyatt uh, and, and Cedric Tillman went, this is still an offense that's going to score points. So I think they've reloaded at receiver. You know, I really like Squirrel White. I think I've heard a lot of good things about him. I think there's some confidence that Thornton, uh, you know, the transfer from Oregon can maybe break out and do a little more than what he showed up there in Eugene. Brew McCoy is going to have plenty of opportunities. Deep running back room at Tennessee, you mm-hmm. know, very, very kind of a sneak, sneaky deep running back room. If my one concern, uh, I don't know if it's a concern, but if maybe my one question for the Vols, and I've kind of touched on this elsewhere a couple times this offseason, it's just how does that starting line you know, that that offensive line kind of builds some continuity. Obviously, you lose Darnell Wright. He was a first-round pick. You lose Carvin. Uh, Some other pieces are kind of being, you know, uh, jockeyed around a little bit. And so, you know, how how does that group kind of come together? Because I do think that uh, was a big strength for Tennessee last season. And it allowed, you know, Javari Small uh, and Jalen, you know, in the backfield to kind of be able to push the, you know, push some holes create some nice lanes and then you know you protect hooker and and that's that's how you all of a sudden are hitting those you know lighting up the scoreboard and it's changing versus alabama because he's not getting hit so uh Uh how does the offensive line come together but offensively no concerns with tennessee right now yeah you look at that offensive line jerome carvin was starting games here at tennessee when you were covering the balls i mean he he was i was covered his recruitment i ap (laughs) and ap and i filmed his uh commitment video so yeah, w- w- one of those many drives uh, down down to Memphis. You went you went to Memphis as well for Amari Thomas, didn't you? Yes, I did. I remember. Did. I remember. Those were the days. Um, hey, speak, speaking of the running backs, you, you kind of mentioned that. Uh, speaking on how they have such a uh, a deep room, I was noticing in your unit rankings, Tennessee's group didn't crack your top ten or, or however many you did, but they were mentioned in like the honorable mention or the best of the rest or whatever. Um, what what is holding Tennessee back in that regards nationally? I don't think they have a star in that group, but as you mentioned, I think that uh, you bring back a lot of production, you add to it this offseason. I think top to bottom, that's a pretty good group. I do. I, I just think that the way the running back group has kind of shaken out in college football this season, even Clemson didn't even make that list. And Clemson's got two guys in Phil Maffa and Will Shipley. I mean, it's it's a deep they, – they made honorable mention just like Tennessee, I should say. Yep. They didn't make the quote-unquote top ten. It, it's just That's just a deep group. Uh, there's a lot of really talented running backs, both I think that have kind of star potential. And then there's several rooms, 
Tennessee is in this category. I think Georgia is in this category. They did make the list because I think they maybe have a little bit higher of a ceiling. But, you know, maybe they don't have that bell cow guy, but they got four or five guys that I think are going to garner a decent amount of touches. And so I, I like a lot. I like a, a lot of, you know, the options that Tennessee has in the backfield. I just think um, some of these other teams maybe have some higher ceilings just in terms of the star power, you know, alone. In your opinion, does Tennessee's defense need to be quote unquote good? I mean, they, they need to get better. They need to be good in areas. Uh, but complementing this offense, it's of my opinion that you don't have to be an elite type defense. You just need to get out the field on third downs, create some takeaways, get better with the front four to help out that secondary. Cause the secondary last year was really what was holding you back. Yeah. I mean, I wrote, I have a column on this at on three, I, you know, I know Josh is out there. Uh, maybe he's, maybe he's throwing the fans a little red meat. You know, it's this time of year, you're doing the big orange caravan and, and you say something that maybe gets uh, a tad more hyperbolic than it should have been when he says, you know, Tennessee's going to play elite defense. I, I personally don't think that will ever happen with Josh Heupel at head coach. Mm-hmm. And I just think uh, his scheme is partly to blame for that. You know, it's just very difficult to pair up an elite defense opposite uh, an offense that plays that fast. When you're on the field, you know, for, for that many more snaps compared to your opponents, it's just on a yard for play basis, it's going to be difficult. To your point, though, you're right. They they just they improved in several spots a year ago. They were terrible in year one with Tim Banks on third down. They were awful uh, in the red zone. They were terrible in the red zone. Both of those metrics improved dramatically in 2022, and I think that was a big reason why um, they did, you know, have a lot of success in some of these bigger games. I think they need to be good if they want to actually be a college football playoff contender. If you just want to win nine, 10 games, I think you're right to quote unquote, just be better. It is probably, you know, where, where you could land. The secondary was awful last year. I mean, there's no way to kind of sugarcoat that 127th, I think in pass defense, Mm -hmm. they allowed more, uh, you know, 10 plus yard completions than any team in the sec. And there is a little bit of feast or famine with the way I think Tim uh, Banks schemes up that defense where he is, you know, overly aggressive at times to kind of create those negative plays to to create that havoc. Um, And yeah, I mean, it produced a a bunch of interceptions and takeaways and and tackles for loss, but it also comes with guys running wide open, I think, a little bit too often. So we'll see if, you know, the personnel is not really all that different for Tennessee in the secondary. They did bring in um the kid from BYU you know played three years at Vanderbilt Mm -hmm. spent a season out um in Salt Lake and now he's back in the SEC can he push a guy like Danico Slaughter to be better can Kamal Haddon you know it's kind of it's kind of now or never for a bunch of these guys there are a bunch of these guys are gonna be seniors um and if they want to you know make it to the next level and play in the NFL I think they're gonna have to show some improvement I like McDonald at star you know, I think that he, you know, he he is a he's a nice piece uh, there at kind of nickel star. But I think the rest of those guys they're gonna they're gonna need to really improve if Tennessee is going to be a you know championship contender or, or really kind of uh, pose a dangerous threat to Georgia in the East this fall. McDonald was one third of the Whitehaven trio. If you go back to recruiting days, um, and you're right. I mean, you got Kamal Haddon, you've got uh, Wesley Walker, you've got Jalen McCullough. I mean, you've got all these guys who have played so much football, and they played good football at times, but it's never been good consistently. So, you know, we'll see if 2023 can be kind of any different in that regard. Um, not to get too much in the weeds of recruiting, but do you like the way Josh Heupel has recruited the, the first couple of cycles in terms of he is prioritizing quarterback, getting after the quarterback? Now, these these guys got to grow up a little bit, but James Pierce, Joshua Josephs, Shanavion Bradley. Um, you know, Caleb Herring, now you get, you know, Kellen Lindstrom and, and you're still working and working and trying to get some elite pass rushers. I think he's done a really nice job in terms of bringing those guys on campus. And this season, hopefully you'll see some of those guys grow up and, and, and make a difference, you know, for Tim Banks in that group. Yeah. I mean, he, one guy you didn't mention, he's not a pass rusher per se, but I know from, from y'all stuff at VolQuest and talking to some other people, I think, you know, Carter linebacker, I mean, I think he's, oh, yeah. you know, uh, garnered a lot of praise, um, and I think a guy who's going to see the field early, I think that linebacking core, there's opportunity there. I know, again, they brought in another transfer from BYU. But I think what, what Josh and his staff have done 
uh, on the recruiting trail is solid. Again, pimping my own work here, I think, you know, eight, 12 weeks ago, I wrote a column that I think frustrated some folks at VolQuest. Some of my former fan, fans, you know, there on the on the nice GQ where I basically former fans, said, hey, <laughs> former fans. Yeah, I got I have one or two, and then I have you know some some not not so not so nice guys. But it's all it's all in good fun. But I I I it was right around when Josh got the big contract, and you know he deserved that raise. He got the big bump. What he, what he's done in two seasons, uh, in very short order returning Tennessee to national prominence again. That's not nothing. Um, but now if Tennessee does want to be a truly national championship contender on an annual basis, not a once every four or five years we have a magical season deal, but if they want to see themselves in the same, you know, let's you build a house, you want to live in the best neighborhood. If you want to live in the same neighborhood with Georgia and Alabama and Michigan and those sorts of schools, you have to start recruiting like a big boy. And and so mm-hmm. it's stacking these blue chippers on top of one another. Florida, Billy Napier's experience in this same deal. Signed a pretty good, pretty nice class a year ago. A lot of Gator fans don't really care because they went 6-6, six and six, uh, and so they want to see the results on the field, and yet Billy has continued to kind of play through the process. Well, now, it's a totally different situation. We'll see how it goes. But what Florida's done on the recruiting trail – uh, right now in 24, really strong. Tennessee, off to a nice start. And so it's about landing as many elite guys as possible. This is, a you know, football is pretty simple, Kane. It's about blocking and tackling. It's about having more dudes than the other team. Um, and, you know, there's some, there's some schools, whether it's in Athens or Tuscaloosa, that have figured that out as well as anyone. I think Josh, you know, believes that with his offensive scheme, maybe he doesn't need – the pinnacle or the peak of elite talent, but they got to get that, that blue chip ratio has got to continue uh, to be pointing North and continue to get better as you stack these classes, one on top of another. No doubt about it. And he'll continue on that uh, upward trajectory or continue to try to stay on that upward trajectory over the off season as uh, the month of June is going to be huge for official visits. And then, uh, the way the calendar works, you, you'll be looking forward to some commitments for the month of July as well. Uh, we'll have more with Jesse Simonton coming up next here on a Locked On Vols. But if you're looking for a delicious snack but don't want to sacrifice the taste, you've got to try Built Bars or Built Puffs. Uh, 100% real chocolate, so it feels like you're eating a candy bar. Taste like you're eating a candy bar, but you're not eating a candy bar. It's got 17 grams of protein. It's got 4 grams of sugar. Only 130 calories, but still... 100% real dark chocolate. It's awesome. And you can order specialty flavors over at Built.com. You can go to Walmart or your local Sam's Club now, and you can buy them off the rack where you know you weren't, you didn't have that luxury uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that's something new that's uh, with Built Bar. You can buy your bars or the puffs up on the racks at Sam's or your local Walmart. But if you want churro, peanut butter, brownie, cookies and cream, whatever specialty flavor you want, you can still get that at Built.com. It's real dark chocolate, real dark chocolate, only 130 calories, 17 grams of protein. Do not sacrifice taste for health. You can get them both. That is at built.com. We'll go back into lockdown ball segment. Number two, we got Jesse Simonton of on three joining us here today. And, uh, you know, we're talking a lot of Tennessee right now. Let's go from a national perspective, Joe Milton. I feel like there's a lot of love there, a lot of love there. And maybe for for us, you know, closer to it, it's yeah, you're comfortable with it, but it's very much all right. Go prove it, you know, week in and week out. Kind of, what do you see in Joe Milton? Obviously, the potential's there, but do you think it's going to go different this go around now that he's in his third year in the system, whereas not fresh out of fall camp and 15 practices, and just said, you know, hey, here's the keys, go. I, I think I'm in the camp, maybe maybe closer to where the local where where the local guys are feeling, where it's. I loved what I saw against Clemson in the Orange Bowl. I think there was still some warts there when you you peel back the tape against Vanderbilt. You know, obviously Tennessee ran roughshod over the Commodores in that game, um, and, and Joe got the win. Uh, but there was some some of the same, you know, can't throw it in the ocean throws uh, where a guy's running wide open and he just overshoots him, uh, and that happened a couple times, and so. I think the potential's there. I mean, I, I've said this many times in the last couple of weeks or so on various outlets that 
it would not surprise me at all if this time next year we're talking about Joe Milton like how folks talked about Anthony Richardson. Now, it's not a one-to-one comparison because I don't think that Joe is quite the, you know, complete freakazoid athlete that Anthony is, but he may actually be a more developed quarterback. He certainly has played a lot more, even though he's been a backup now, you know, at Tennessee for a season and a half, spent some time, you know, uh, getting his feet wet at Michigan. I, I think the upside is is tremendous. Um, you know, he has probably the strongest arm uh, in college football. It's just going to be about consistency. You know, it has been proven. We have seen it. These guys are outliers, but it has been proven that you can improve your accuracy. Josh Allen is not the only one. He is the most famous quarterback, uh, you know, to kind of basically completely change his mechanics and improve his accuracy, but he's not the only one. And so, there seems to be optimism that Joe has improved in that area, that he has improved his footwork. Um, I'd like to maybe see him run a little bit more uh, when he does get his opportunities. It kind of seems like he kind of shies away it, uh, or maybe he wants to be like, I'm just going to be the quarterback. Um, I think Tennessee should lean into that. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard to tackle a guy that big uh, <laughs> at times, you know? Um, so we'll see. I mean, it, we'll see. It also is going to depend how, how, how ready is Nico? Obviously, every Tennessee fan thinks Nico Alamalieva is ready to be the starter uh, now. Um, but does the staff feel the same way? I think we've kind of seen the way the spring played out. Joe's going to get every opportunity to be the guy. Now, if he falters, that's when you, you know, kind of turn to, to the next man up, which is you know the, the, the Pied Piper and the guy that so many folks are excited about on, in Knoxville. Um, but I think this is going to be Joe's team until he gives the staff a reason to say it's not. Yeah, it's something that was so underrated about Hendon, I think, is his escapability. Uh, not just to you know take off and run, but if, if somebody's you know rushing up the middle, you know, getting out just of the pocket. Just moving in the pocket. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that pocket mobility and and Joe lost ten pounds over the offseason to try to aid in that, knowing that that needs to be a little bit more a part of his game. And so um, you know, he's, he's a big guy. He's still a big guy, but now he's 10 pounds lighter. So maybe that can help in that regard. Um, earlier this week, it was, uh, if you look up here on the screen, FanDuel released the season totals and you see Tennessee there at nine and a half wins. Uh, what do you like about that number? And what's it going to take for Tennessee to hit that over? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think that's a solid, that's a solid, a good starting point because I think, you know, you look at Tennessee's schedule, um, it's not daunting at all from a non-conference perspective. I know they, they, they have kind of an, an interesting opener, but I don't think uh, anyone believes that Virginia is going to do anything, you know, uh, early in the – that's why it's, it's Virginia, right? Yeah. I'm correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that Tony Elliott's got a tough situation there. So it's about the, the, the SEC play. I could see Tennessee definitely going 10-2 and two again if that defense that we, you know, spent some time discussing – makes that leap, uh, you know, not doesn't have to be elite, just needs to be good. As you said, needs to be better. Um, if they do that, I could see Tennessee winning 10 games again. So that nine and a half, that little hook there, um, you know, with the uncertainty at quarterback, is that how you can, can you, can you see three losses? Maybe. I think 10 and two is, is certainly reasonable. Um, same for, for LSU at that nine and a half hook too. I, I think they're a team that, that, come SEC media days when we're in Nashville, um, you know, I, I think ultimately the Tigers, not the Tide, are going to be the pick to win the SEC West again. Florida, five and a half wins. It's just, Oof. that's that's just shocking to me to even see that Oof. on paper. I, I think that, I think there's more wins on that schedule, but again, I don't think they're going to go past, you know, eight wins max. It's tough, man. I don't know. There's a, there's a real lack of juice around no. that program. Um, I mean, you, you, you think about it. Last year they go 6-6, six and six and they beat Utah to start the season. This year they have Utah out in Salt Lake City. Now, there's going to be a lot of Gator fans there. I think they've, they've bought up something like 20 – they've crazy, like 20-something thousand tickets. Uh, but that's – it's a tough – I think they played Texas A&M this year too. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be tough sledding for uh, a Florida team that, that clearly – is in transition. When you add that, you're playing Texas A&M, Utah, Tennessee, Georgia, LSU. You know, I think Arkansas. that's my five L's. Are, that's five L's right there. I yeah. mean, you know, so I, 
I don't know. That's it's gonna be tough. Billy Billy's in a Billy's in a in a sticky sticky spot right now down in Gainesville. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, you know, year number two. If you're not seeing much progress there, then the you know your fans are gonna get restless. So it'll be interesting to see what's going on. Last thing I got well, for you, know, you. Go ahead. Let me just let me just touch. I just want to touch on this. I think it'll be kind of interesting for Tennessee fans to maybe hear this. That what's what's notable about what's happening in Gainesville is that it's less restlessness and more apathy, and that's da- that's more dangerous. Yeah. Whereas when Tennessee, whereas when Tennessee was running bad, end of Butch Jones, Dooley, all that, Tennessee fans were still showing up in droves. That th- their level of commitment did not change. Tennessee fans got angrier. They got louder. We saw what happened with Shiano. You know that that that. But they they did, apathy did not set in, and I think it's very dangerous, especially in college football, when a fan base as once as proud, you know, and has the you know the the former championship pedigree that Florida has, suddenly just kind of turns off the dial, they, that spigot that was you know flowing to kind of pay for all this stuff, mm-hmm. maybe maybe isn't flowing so much anymore that that's very dangerous. And so again, that's why Billy, that's why I, I do not envy the spot that Billy's in right now. It's a really, really good point. Really good point. Last thing I want to ask you about is a uh, quarterback situation in Alabama, obviously third Saturday in October. It's, it's not going anywhere. Is it going to be Ty Simpson? Is it going to be Jalen Milrow? Is it going to be Tyler Buckner who coming in from Notre Dame, second window, second transfer portal window, reuniting with Tommy Reese, um, just brought in one of the best recruiting classes ever under Nick Saban. That team is still built the right way, but for the first time in a while, you, you have qu- questions at quarterback, and you're significantly going to be worse at quarterback, and I feel like I have to rely on run game defense like the old Alabama. Yeah, I think that was Nick's plan originally. I also think that uh, he, he thought he was going to have maybe a little bit more stability at that quarterback position than he does right now. Um, the most interesting dynamic of this whole situation to me is that Tommy Reese recruited Sam Hartman to Notre Dame. He was still <laughs> Notre Dame's offensive coordinator when they landed the biggest transfer portal quarterback uh, or the biggest quarter, the best quarterback in the transfer portal this cycle. Or in my opinion, Devin Leary is really good. There's some other guys that have you know moved on, but I think Sam Hartman, you know, holds all sorts of ACC records. Was the number one guy. Tommy Reese identified him. Tommy Reese recruited him for six weeks. Tommy Reese got him on campus. What does that tell me? Tommy Reese wasn't crazy about Tyler Buckner. Tyler Buckner was coming back as Notre Dame's starting quarterback if they didn't get Sam Hartman. He takes the Alabama job. He spends a spring with Ty Simpson and Jalen Milrow, um, both guys who have a lot of potential, both guys who, if they are surrounded by the right pieces, and I do think Alabama's wide receiver room is way better this year. I think Justice Haynes is going to be a stud at running back, and I think a lot of their other running backs, Jace, Roydell, um, you know, they, they got some guys there. Offensive line is going to be better, uh, but I don't think they have a quarterback that's going to elevate their team like they have with the Mac Joneses, with the Tuas, with the Bryce Youngs. Um, and so that's a concern. So then the fact that he says, hey, we need another arm, and they go out and get a guy who, again, he did not think was going to be the start – did not – want to be the starting quarterback at Notre Dame I just think that raises some red flags to me Kane I don't know if it does for you but that 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 to me that says we, we got it we got it we got something wrong here we got something wrong here some something, something's not right so we'll see how it plays out I mean I think you need almost like a three three-headed dice or, or th- you know three face dice or something to roll because I don't know who it's going to be I think you could literally make a, a pretty uh simple argument for each guy Truly, I, I think you know for Buckner, it's not it's not complicated because again he does know Tommy Reese's system. Jalen has the athletic upside, and Ty was a five star. I mean Tennessee really wanted Ty Simpson. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that you know absolutely uh, could be in Knoxville right now and not Tuscaloosa. So there's potential there. So I have no idea which guy right now heading into the fall it's going to be. Truly thought Ty Simpson was going to be the quarterback for Alabama last fall coming to Neyland Stadium. And then, you know, Bryce Young comes in and he's nowhere close to 100%. And he's an All American and almost won that game by himself. So, um, replacing that dude's going to be tough. 
Buckner potentially could, as you mentioned. I, I thought he was behind the A ball initially, but then I'm like, oh yeah, that's going to be a similar system, same system as Tommy Reese. So, you know, that, that'll give him a chance. Milro, then Simpson. So we'll see exactly who Tennessee is squaring off against quarterback wise for Oklahoma on third Saturday in October. But it's going to be fun either way. A lot of time between now and then. And Jesse Simonton's got you covered, covering Tennessee, Alabama, every SEC team in college football. Over it on three. Jesse, what's coming up uh, here in the next couple of weeks? What are some projects you uh, got in store? Well, I got, I've, I'm got i running out some one-on-one -on -one interviews with some guys. So I've sat down with Shane Beamer, Sam Pittman, uh, a couple other heads of Billy, uh, and, and then also kind of not just in the SEC. So kind of highlighting um, some interesting coordinators, guys I wanted to talk to, Phil Longo, Manny Diaz, the like. So I have those. You know, I, I write – uh, you know, a, a column most days on, on kind of what's happening in college football. So I have a piece out today kind of uh, basically putting the, 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 the fire to Steve Sarkeesian. I, you know, Urban comes out and says he's got the number one uh, roster in America. I don't think that's true, but I do think they have the best roster in the Big 12. And in their final season before they come to the SEC, this is a major, major year for the Texas Longhorns in 2023. Jesse, great stuff as always, man. Appreciate you joining us, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Thanks, Kane. All right, we got a final segment left here of this Friday edition of Locked On Vols. Appreciate you guys for being here. Appreciate Jesse for joining me and uh, going through what his thoughts on the upcoming Tennessee uh, football season 2023 schedule, or 2023 schedule to get here before you know it, or the season, rather. And I uh, appreciate Jesse for taking the time and sharing his thoughts. Hey, uh, the last couple of minutes of the show, uh, th these uh, totals came out last week. But as you guys know, been out of commission this week. So I've been pre-recording and scheduling and all this type of stuff. But I did want to hit on the win totals released by FanDuel, our friends at FanDuel. That was last week. And uh, some interesting numbers here. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to flash a graphic up there that you can see. If you're listening, don't worry. I'm going to take care of you. We are an audio-first platform, always have been, always will be. But uh, take a gander at these totals from over at FanDuel. SEC football win totals for the 2023 football season. George is at the top at 11.5 wins. No shocker, right? So essentially you're saying, are they going to go undefeated in the regular season or are they going to lose a game or two? Uh, that over is at plus 116. The under is at minus 142. All right, we'll get to everybody else, but what about Tennessee? What do you think that number for Tennessee is going to be? I believe FanDuel earlier in the offseason, um, if it wasn't FanDuel, I apologize, it was some book that released the 8.5 number for Tennessee, and I thought that was a good number because, you know, I, I thought that was an easy number because I would have taken the over because I think Tennessee's 9-3 and three at worst in the 2023 season. But the updated totals, SEC win totals for the 2023 season, has Tennessee at da 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 nine and a half wins. Wow. Tennessee, I believe, going into the 2023 season, 2022 season was eight wins, if I'm not mistaken. You lose all this, and now the total sits at nine and a half. What's that say about your program? What's that say about what everybody thinks for Josh Heupel and and um, you know Joey Halsley and Tim? Uh, Tim Banks and all that. I mean, what's that say about your program? Nine and a half. I think that is an excellent number because, right? Because I think Tennessee is going nine and three. I think Tennessee could go 10 and two, but I think Tennessee is going nine and three. Are you going to take a chance at Tennessee going nine uh, above nine and three, maybe 10 and two? And if so, you know, if you look at that schedule, what, what do you think? I mean, Virginia should be a dub. Austin B should be a dub. Florida on the road should be a dub, but hey, it's Florida. It's the swamp. For the sake of this argument, we'll say it's a dub. UTSA better be a dub. South Carolina at home better be a dub. AM going to be a challenge. So will South Carolina, of course. Uh, but say you get that win uh, against AM at home. That's a dub. At Alabama. Can you beat Alabama on the road this year? As you know, the Tide's going to be looking for revenge uh, from a season ago. Quarterback play very uncertain, even if they, they start one of those three guys that's in the house right now. Of course, including the transfer of Tyler Buckner from Notre Dame. It's a new system offensively. You don't have the best player in the country in Bryce Young. You're taking a serious step back at quarterback, whoever plays that. Can you win on the road, though, because all around you're still a really good football team? You know, for the sake of this argument, we will say that's a loss. So you're still 6-1, and one, right? Winning at Kentucky won't be easy. Should be a dub. 7-1, and one. UConn, dub. 8-1, and one. Missouri at, on the road, dub. 9-1, and one. Georgia. 
at Neyland Stadium. For the sake of this argument, let's say it's a loss, 9-2, and two, and then Vanderbilt's a dub, 10-2. and two. So if you beat everybody on your schedule, except Alabama and Georgia, you're at 10-2. But again, at Florida, it's not going to be easy. At home against Garrett Carolina, not easy. At home against AM, not easy. On the road at Kentucky, not easy. I think Tennessee's 9-3 football team. I do. But I love this number, 9.5. What say you? Are you the over or the under? The over is sitting at plus 146. The under is at minus 100. Juice is at plus 146 for the over. The under is at minus 100. All right, so where are you guys at uh, for Tennessee? Tennessee, the fourth highest or tied for the second highest total uh, in the SEC this year, according to our friends over to FanDuel. Georgia, 11.5. Alabama, 10.5. LSU, 9.5. Tennessee, 9.5. You're in that upper echelon of SEC teams with Georgia, Alabama, LSU, and then Tennessee. How about that, guys? How about that? Ole Miss coming in behind Tennessee at 7.5. A&M is at 7.5. Kentucky is at 6.5. I think you'll take that over for Kentucky. Um, I think there's opportunity for an over uh, for A&M as well, but uh, maybe not. Auburn is at 6.5. Gosh, a lot of teams have these low totals here. That's interesting. Auburn, six and a half. Arkansas, six and a half. State, six and a half. Missouri, six and a half. South Carolina, six and a half. Florida, five and a half. Vanderbilt, three and a half. I say this again Florida, five and a half. Vanderbilt, three and a half. You sprint to that over for Florida, in my opinion, because they're going to get at least six wins. And it's really tough, in my opinion. It's really tough to lose nine football games. I mean, it's not like four and eight's even better, right? But it's really tough to lose nine football games. That's what this is saying. If you take the under three and a half for Vanderbilt, you are going three and nine. So I, I would take the over there as well. Um but interesting there, I mean, Tennessee, the tie for the third highest win total in the SEC for the for the uh, upcoming football season at nine and a half, tied with LSU. Um, I would take the over. Or I, gosh, that's such a good that is such a good number. That is such a good number, man. That is such a good number. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, what say you? You taking that over? You taking that under? Uh, Georgia, essentially, you're saying are they going to go undefeated? Alabama. Uh, you know, losing one game, LSU's in the same boat as Tennessee. Are you going ten and two? You going nine and three? Um, Ole Miss, A and M, both have seven and a half. Uh, Kentucky, Auburn, Arkansas, Mississippi State, Missouri, and South Carolina all at the six and a half. Florida five and a half. Vanderbilt three and a half. What say you? Uh, look how far Tennessee has come. Look how far the University of Tennessee has come. Kind of hard to believe, right? Uh, but yeah, those were uh, shared by FanDuel last week, and I wanted to uh, get them in here while I was uh, pre-recording some shows for, of course, today and, and this week. Hey, I will be back um, this week, right? Tennessee baseball playing, or next week, Tennessee baseball playing a monster series on the road to conclude the regular season against South Carolina. Uh, we'll talk about that, the postseason outlook, Tennessee and Hoover. I'll be on the road, uh, but I will be giving you some locked on balls each and every day, so you have that to look forward to. Um, yeah, I appreciate you guys hanging in there. We'll recap any of the breaking news that I missed from this past week. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for being an everydayer and for coming back. Subscribe to the channel on Locked On Balls and wherever you listen to our podcast. Appreciate you guys as always. This is Locked On Balls.